Okay. All right, so I am Tara Jacob. I am the genealogy and local history librarian at Algonquin Area Public Library, and I'm so excited to see so many people here today. It's so it's such a nice change <laughs> from being so isolated, um, and I'm glad you guys made time tonight to come. Um, so uh, would you two like to introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Kate. Oh, either way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Mills. Uh, I'm the genealogy and local history librarian at the Barrington Area Library. And uh, yes, I would like to say thank you all for coming. It's great seeing all of you. Hi, I'm Nancy Gaynor. I work, as I like to say, part part time at both the Curie Public Library and the ELA Area Public Libraries. And uh, ditto to what my cohorts have said. It's great to see you all here. Hopefully we'll have a great discussion. Yes, and we hope that you're all prepared with questions. Um, today our topic is going to be talking about what kinds of databases and websites you can use from home during this time when all of our libraries are unfortunately inaccessible. Um, and fortunately there are lots of great options. Um, so if you do have a question or a suggestion, something that you like to use, please feel free to mention it. We really anticipate this being really conversational um, and it'll make it more fun for us and for you. And maybe remind us of some things that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise too. Um, so, fake news. Sorry. Sorry. No worries. Is that me? Yep, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that background music? <laughs> it was delightful. Sorry. Um, so the big news that I think we've all been really excited about is normally, as most of you probably know, Ancestry is only available from within our libraries. Um, they're really restrictive that way. Um, but currently, Ancestry Library Edition is making itself available um, through many libraries remotely. Um, and so you need to be a library card holder at that library where you're trying to access it, and you'll have to go to their databases page and log on. And um, from our discussions beforehand, I think... Um, uh, I think all of our libraries are offering um, are offering remote access, um, and so if you don't know if your library is offering it or not, I would highly recommend reaching out to your librarian. If, for for those of you who are librarians who are here, um, are your libraries offering remote access for the most part? To yes, Curie and Ela are. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods. Cool. Okay, yeah, so that's really exciting. Um, it means we all, and Indian Trails is, um, it means that we all have a lot of uh, flexibility to do some research from home we might not normally be able to. Joliet is doing it too. Um, so very cool. Um, and of course, then there's some of our old standby favorites. Um, oh, one more thing. If you're not familiar with how to use the Ancestry Library Edition, um, or if you're just not super comfortable with it yet, um, there is this software called Niche Academy, and I will share the link to the course in the chat box. Um, it'll take me just a minute to pull it up, so maybe when we start talking about other websites, I will post it, and I'll make, I'll, I'll make sure and point out that I do. But um, Niche Academy offers an Ancestry Library Edition class, um, and so we are offering that through Algonquin Public Libraries. So that'll be where you're accessing it through, but it's available to anybody without a library card. Um, so you're all welcome to go ahead and use that class if you'd like. Um, if you want to get more acquainted, um, or if you have some free time and you're bored and you just want to see what it's all about. Um, so that's a possibility too. Um, but other than that, as far as, uh, as far as you guys, Kate and Nancy, what are some of your favorite go-to research websites that you like to use from home? Well, uh, every, uh, everyone should have a free account to familysearch.org. Um, you can search, you can search to your heart's content from home and find things, uh, for down the street, for your state, for across the country, for across the world. Things aren't just in English. They may be, very well may be, in the home language. It may be typeset, and it may be handwriting. It may be very grainy. But uh, FamilySearch.org is a fantastic site. Sign up for a free account. Um, that You don't get any mail that you don't want. And um, once you have an account, you can use it at home. At, like I like to say, 2 o'clock in the morning in your PJs, 
You can use it two o'clock in the afternoon in your library. Some public libraries are also affiliate libraries. Um, and there's quite a few of us that are participants today. And um, I also found that I could take my iPad into the parking lot at Cary and the Wi-Fi signal works out in the front parking lot if you're closer to the building and you can access our affiliate level records um, in the parking lot. And I know Crystal Lake, well, I don't think Crystal Lake Public Library is an affiliate, but I do know that they did move their um, Wi-Fi router to be closer to the parking lot for people. So your public library may have done that too. And if it's an affiliate, it's not a bad idea. Uh, the family history centers though are closed. So, you know, as far as going outside their parking lot and doing the same thing, I don't think that's an option. Yeah, and, uh, and Tina's saying that, that she also offered that to some of her library or to some of her patrons as well. Um, so, um, and you know, and I think what Comcast is doing, they have access to their free wireless hotspots that they normally, they normally just offer that to paying customers. But now um, if you're able to get on the internet, even with a smart device, or if you're able to go into like a library parking lot and get on for a few seconds, you can sign up for an account with them, a free, a totally free account and use any of their wireless hotspots for free um, during the time when this pandemic is going on. So there, there've been a lot of companies, I think that have really stepped up to try to make the internet accessible, which is nice. So if you know, I, I mean, obviously all of you have been able to get online today, so that's great. Um, but if you know of somebody who is struggling and who isn't hooked into the internet, that's kind of an awesome thing to be aware of as well. I think one of the things to be aware of with family search, I've seen a number of people on different Facebook groups saying, oh, why can't family search open up access to records like Ancestry has? they're under different stipulations. They have community by community, government unit by government unit contracts that limit, that stipulate the limitations on access. So yes, there are some things that you can access at home and there are things that you have to go to Salt Lake City to access and that's not gonna change during this time. Yeah, and another great thing about, about Family Search, if, if you are familiar with their website, um, some people who even use Family Search regularly don't use the wiki, and the wiki is such a great resource mm -hmm. to find additional um, websites you can visit for free a lot of the time. Some of them are paid, but a lot of them are free, um, and so I think that's like kind of a great, almost encyclopedic tool to give you direction, um, especially since it's not as easy to just walk into your local library and get you know, get the help you might need. Um, so that's another kind of cool way to use Family Search. And on that note, I think a fabulous resource that Kate mentioned um, when we were discussing this beforehand is Cindy's List. Um, so how do you normally use Cindy's List, Kate, when you're doing research? Uh, usually it's either the first thing I go to or the last thing I go to because I don't know anything about a topic or I'm running out of things <laughs> that I do know about. Um, so I will go to Cindy's list for uh, up front to figure out what would be available on a certain topic or I use it as a last resort when I run out of things that I'm aware of but it's invaluable and thank you Cindy <laughs> for doing yeah. all that work for us. Yeah. A similar site is linkpendium.com. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, it's very similar. Um, there's probably a lot of overlap, but again, between the Family Search Wiki, um, Cindy's List, and Linkpendium, you've got a lot of bases covered, especially when you're dealing with geography you're not familiar with, religions you're not familiar with. Um, just, you know, you've hit that brick wall and it, don't know where to go. Yeah, absolutely. And so if any of you don't use Cindy's List, it's spelled a little bit different than you might expect. It's C-Y-N-D-I. Um, is It's the name of the woman who, who has organized and curated all these websites and is, again, kind of kind of like the wiki on Family Search. It's like a big encyclopedia full of things, which I think is kind of how Linkpendium works, too. And just I can't imagine the amount of time it takes to put these together. So I'd absolutely use them. They're incredible resources. Um, and so um, we have a question from Jerry about about how you find current records, like things from the 1970s to present. Do either of you have any suggestions for how you might do that? 
<laughs> we'll both go silent. <laughs> right. Um, it depends on your on um, what you're looking for. Obviously, we've got uh, Chicago Tribune and New York Times and those sort of things for articles that far back. Um, right. It's hard with the current ones because, like, we're not even going getting the census until uh, for 1950 yet. So anything after that is quite difficult. Um, what else would we use? I think um, Google. <laughs> yeah. Googling names. Google, yeah. Um, or some libraries have things like Reference USA or um, some of the kind of telephone book um, searching. I'm trying to think of some of the ones. Record, there's like record search ones. Right. Um, Michael Lacopo uh, did a panel on finding the living. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had some good sources for uh, newer things like uh, Family Tree Now, is it? And um, what's the other one? Addresses.com for finding people, that, that sort of thing. My life, he's, because uh, all of the free phone number sites have all of a sudden yeah. become paid phone number sites. Uh, but he suggested those three for finding the living, the, the current people. I actually found a cousin that I used to be in touch with and um, knew that her husband died about 10 years ago. And I was Googling her name and finding a lot of <laughs> donation sites that had listed them, but also some um, address sites that just, you know, give that little bit of a teaser of an address. And I thought I had the address still. I uh, did some more Googling. I found the retirement village and I contacted them and I said, I know because of HIPAA, you can't tell people anything about residents, but can you at least tell me yes or no if she's still alive because she's going to be 103 this year. And I thought, what are the chances that she's still alive? And it turns out she is still alive and she wants to hear from us again. So I'm really thrilled. So, you know, it, it occurs to me, we're trying to kind of type out these websites and put them into the chat box as we're saying them. But what I think I'm going to do is after this webinar is over, probably tomorrow sometime, why don't I type up a list? I'll go through, I'll watch the recording because we are recording this. Um, and I'll type up a list of all the websites. And how about I just email you all a list of all of the websites that we end up talking about. And that way we won't miss any um, as we're going through. So we'll keep trying to tell you. So if you're keeping notes, you'll, you'll see it in the chat box. Um, but that way, at least you'll get a, a kind of an overview afterwards, okay? <laughs> um, and, yeah. <laughs> um, so we had a question about finding fi finding newspapers for free on the, on the internet, and I think there are just tons of great sources for that. Um, and so um, maybe we can talk a little bit about some places where we can find find those. Um, and so, of course, there are the library databases if you do have a library card. Um, I think every library has some different ones. So like at Algonquin, we've got newspapers.com. I know at Indian Trails, they had Access Newspapers um, or Access Newspapers USA. I, it has different names. But anyway, it's a slightly different database with slightly different newspapers. Um, so what are some that you, you guys like to use? Do you have any databases, any free websites? The free one out there is uh, Chronicling America. Uh, which is one of my favorites, and Elfind, E-L-P-H-I-N-D dot com. Uh, those would be two free sites, and Nancy, you had mentioned a couple of others. Yeah, um, a couple others, and again, we'll give you um, web addresses. I'm dealing with a brick wall in New York State, and I've come across old Fulton, New York postcards, um, and you'd think, oh, this is New York. It's only New York, but it's not. He, the gentleman that runs this website is scanning microfilm and putting the microfilm up. It is a very rough site. You have to excavate. You have to poke through things, but I have found things there. Um, also, I've had a lot of good luck with just plain old Google News Archive. I have found newspapers, um, you know, and with any of these sites, it tends to be, you know, the newspapers that they can find. Not necessarily every issue of every month or that was published is still, still available. So you may miss a paper at Old Fulton, but you might find it at Google News Archive. So don't give up once you can't find it on newspapers.com. Again, because I'm dealing with New York, I've got um, also... There's a New York State Historic Newspaper site that I've had some really good luck with also. 
And then there's a website called theancestorhunt.com. And they list newspapers from all over the place. Those are awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, it can be frustrating trying to find papers. And you've got to be careful with websites or, excuse me, services that you sign up for, you know, newspapers.com, genealogy bank, etc. They might cover an area that you're interested in, but not the dates that you're looking for. Um, some of the sites or some of the companies tend to seem to have more modern newspapers. And if you're looking for something from 1813, like I am, it ain't going to be there. So you've got to really do some detective work before you put out money for a subscription. Yeah. And Ellen Blake just mentioned a really good tip. She said she suggests Googling local libraries and genealogy societies in the area you're researching to see if they've done any digitization, which is a really good point because like at Algonquin, we've done some of our own transcription and digitization of older newspapers that are you can see on our databases page, but um, you might not know that they would be there otherwise. And I've seen some actually um, in, I, so my research is kind of right on the border between New York and Pennsylvania. So I go my, my people are on both sides, so, um, but so New York and Pennsylvania, there are a lot of small libraries that do digitization projects, and sometimes it's kind of difficult because some of them will actually just have like JPEGs of all of the, you know, actual images without OCR or anything searchable of all the pages, and you have to kind of go through them, um, but still, it's an invaluable resource if they're the only ones that have it, um, so that's pretty cool, and Susan mentioned um, that she's found that you can go to a state's newspaper archive, and that's true. Some states actually archive their newspapers, and some universities do too. Um, there's a university in Michigan that has done, they've been going around and doing a bunch of local newspapers. It's a big, you know, and I, I wish I should, before I say these things, I should look up the address. I will find the address for you and post it in case you're curious, but, um, but they have a really, if anything in Michigan, they've been doing a really good job digitizing that. Um, and somebody else had mentioned checking find a grave. Um, sometimes they do have obituaries and stuff there. Do they have other newspaper articles on find a grave often? Um, sometimes if there's sometimes. Been a, a biography written on someone, yes. Cool. Yeah, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, some, like, Internet Archive, I think, has some newspapers, some of the older ones anyway. Um, it's not as common, but... Um, but that kind of brings us into the idea of like book websites um, and like some of the, the cool things that you can find about genealogy and books. And I think for me, like Internet Archive is such a great place to check because they have so many of those county histories. Like if you just search their databases, like you can search for a surname, but if you search and do a full text search for um, like a county or a city that you're researching, a lot of times you can pull up one of those old 1800s, you know, encyclopedic, here's a record of our town so far. And a lot of times they'll have beautiful pictures of buildings and rundowns of local businesses. So if your ancestor was a business owner um, and if it was a more prominent person in the city or one of the older settlers, they'll sometimes have a full biography of the person. So that's really exciting. And I think Kate, you had some recommendations. Um, like yes, I've had, I've had luck with Google Books. Uh, just going in and searching Google, but under their books uh, category. And I found things quite amazing things <laughs> that I would be surprised. Uh, full text, whole book right there on the screen. Some aren't, uh, and you have to try for interlibrary loan, but at least it gives you a place to look. And the other one uh, is Hatha Trust, uh, which is another online book uh, uh, site that is just amazing with full text sources on there as well. And really, really good for genealogy. That's and of awesome. course, Family Search does have a lot of full text things there also. And state libraries and um, Allen County Library have digitized a bunch of things. I know I had I donated to them uh, a family history that I had from family, and they digitized it and added the physical volume to their collection. And I've been able to refer new cousins to that book in the catalog, and they've been able to you know, pull up the whole book and download it. So, yeah. And um, 
and Dan just asked, um, does any newspaper site have the old Chicago papers like the Daily News or early 1900s, late 1800s non-Tribune papers? And um, just my two cents is that I was unable to find the Daily News online anywhere in a digitized format. Um, the Newberry Library does have it on microfilm. Um, and that was where I ended up going to get it because I couldn't, I couldn't find it on any of the sites. Do you guys know of any good places to look for older Chicago papers or the Daily News? I don't know. I haven't had to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not daily. We, as I said, we get Tribune back to 1840 yeah. and New York Times back to 1840 with the standard databases that we subscribe to. Yeah, I think I, I want to say it's Access Newspapers has some of the old um, Chicago newspapers. Um, and I think that the Chronicling America does have a couple of them too, like the Daybook, I think is in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I was able to find a few um, of those, but, um, but without using a database, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much like you'd have. <laughs> Um, so, and then, you know, going from there, um, there are some, also some really great government resources out there. I think we were kind of talking about state websites. And of course, um, we have uh, that great, um, we have a National Archives here in Illinois, which is a great resource, but also the National Archives website is fun. And it has that history hub. Not only is it searchable, where you can look for a bunch of um, pictures, they have a nice postcard collection, but also um, if you make an account, you can go into their history hub and it's kind of, um, it's like a crowdsourced knowledge base of like people working together to kind of solve problems and, and find information for you. Um, and you can ask questions there and a lot of times get answers from either staff members or other people who are um, experts in their subject matter or who are regular researchers. Um, so it's a really nice cross-section of people who do all kinds of different things. You've got professional historians, teachers, um, archivists, librarians, um, genealogists, all kinds of researchers there um, who are all working from different angles. So it can be a really good resource if you have just a question you want to ask or you want to kind of put the hive mind to work on your research. Are there, and then we've already talked kind of about the Library of Congress, which has Chronicling America. Um, and it also has some other really cool things if you, um, if you have time to just putz around, if you've got a brick wall you're facing up against. Um, they've got like a folk music collection where some of their researchers went around the US and just collected different you know, oral histories or like folk music um, labeled with names too. So a lot of it's very searchable. Um, so if you know you've got some musicians in your family and you see a state represented there, you know, hey, who knows? <laughs> Are there any other government websites that you guys use in your research at all? Um, things like CyberDrive uh, for my Illinois-based kinds of things, and that has the marriage records and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'll pop into CyberDrive and, and use their global search to find records. And of course, too, when you, you talk about Illinois, there's the Illinois uh, Digital Archive for oh, wow. all of our, oh, there goes my dog again, um, for our documents that have been archived. Um, oh, wow. I know my library um, has links to things that have been loaded and we're in the process of loading more. And one of the projects that we just started is asking people for their, to write up their stories of their experiences during this stay at home time and they'll be archived on um, Ida. Um, let's see, another one flitted into my head and went out. Oh, I know, um, Soldiers and Sailors for um, the, combatants in the Civil War is a place where you can go and find out what unit an ancestor was in and um, get further information. I can get website later. Awesome. Uh, Digital Public Library of America, is anybody, our librarians here, Diplo, using Diplo? See, um, we do have some feedback. Nobody who's mentioning Diplo right now. Um, but yeah, they've been doing some really incredible work, even, um, you know, unrelated to genealogy lately with their ebook program. Um, that's been really exciting. Let's see. 
Um, and another one that I use, um, and it probably doesn't, it's only useful if you have an ancestor, you're doing research on somebody who you think was likely a homesteader, um, is the land patent search through the U.S. Department of the Interior. Um, so you can do a land patent search and you can pull up the original documents and original plat maps, which is super cool. Well, if you have some homesteaders, um, it gives you a lot of information, um, which is nice. So I'll share that link as well. And then there's always, of course, the Cook County genealogy search, which um, goes through frequent changes and can be more or less useful, but um, gives you a nice index search anyway and the ability to order some records whenever the you know government comes back <laughs> after all of this. Um, and, and so we also have some people who are recommending some other resources in the chat box here. Tina says, Washington State Archives has a phenomenal website. Um, and you know, I've seen Indiana State, if you've got Indiana records, Indiana State Web uh, Archive has fabulous resources too. They've got a really nice searchable database. Um, and Jim, Allen County. Yeah, Allen County is well. Allen County. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, when you're, once you figure out an area that your ancestors from, oh my dog, you should always check out the State Library, State Historical Society, County, historical society, um, genealogical societies, um, the main libraries in that area, and just, you know, canvas things and see, you know, what's available and how, what kind of help they might be able to offer you. Yeah. Um, and a lot of states, Tina's saying a lot of states offer free vital records like Missouri, Arizona, and Virginia. Um, Yeah, there's lots of great ways that we can do research and um, this chat is so active, which is amazing, but I'm having trouble keeping track of your questions, guys. I'm so sorry. So if I miss you, feel free to repeat yourself. <laughs> if I live in Geneva, can I access the library edition of Ancestry and or newspapers in Batavia or St. Charles? So if, do we have a librarian from Geneva here today? I don't know if we do. Um, if so if you are a member of the Geneva Library with a library card and the Geneva Library has worked with Ancestry to, to make remote access available um, because some libraries were able to do it and some weren't. It was really difficult. It was really fast. Um, here's, I will say don't judge your library if they weren't able to do it because we had almost no time to figure it out and their technical requirements were, they were really um, asking a lot from us. So it was um, in the midst of everything else really difficult, I think, for our IT teams to really figure out how to execute the remote access. Um, okay, so it, looks like, it looks like Geneva does have um, access. I'm at Geneva Public Library and you get um, routed over to a sign-in that you have to give your library card number. Perfect. So yes, so then you can access through, if you're a member of Geneva Public Library, you can use your library card to access it from anywhere right now. It doesn't matter where you are. So um, just so make sure with any of our libraries, go to your library's webpage. Yes. Take a look at the front page because a lot of times we're able to post special announcements on projects or opener, opener access, more open access. Um, if you can't see it on the front page, go to the list of databases. If it's difficult there, see if there's a genealogy page. Um, you know, do a little bit of poking around. I went to Geneva, was it gpld.org, their database list, there's Ancestry, I clicked on it and it comes up saying, what's your, bar what's your library card number? Yeah. Oh, yes. Perfect. Thank you, Nancy, for checking yep. that. Um, and Louise says that a great site for digitized Illinois newspapers um, and a directory to libraries that hold original papers, that's really helpful, um, is uh, at, it looks like the University of Illinois website, their library website. So she has posted the link there. So check that out if you're looking for Illinois newspapers. Um, and let's see, did someone already mention Google Books for Old Town History and Family History Books? That's a good point. We did talk about Google Books a little bit, but I think I emphasized that more on Internet Archive, but Google Books is a great place to, to find that too. Um, and so many of these places with these older books, you can free text search them, but you can also download the book. Yeah. And you know, a lot of these books are 1890, 1840, whatever. 
And if you can't, if you find it one place and it maybe it's not a real good scan, go to another place. Um, you can find it in each of, you can find a book in all, what is it, four or five of these places that we just mentioned. Yeah. And um, one of our librarians, Julie from Chicago Public Library, mentioned that Chicago Public Library has digitized the Chicago Examiner, Examiner for 1908 to 1918 and gives a link for that. So in reference to that earlier question about early um, Chicago newspapers, that's a great resource. Um, So uh, yeah, so there are so many options and I'm still so far behind on the chat. I'm so sorry guys. <laughs> Swan libraries have, Swan libraries have it available right now, which would include That's the Geneva. Geneva network. Oh, the, the network that Geneva is part of. Oh, okay. I hadn't heard of that one. Okay, perfect. So, um, so that's great. So all of those libraries then have Ancestry available from home right now. And can we explain what land land patents or property searches are? Yes. So, um, so for my ancestors, um, we have a long history in Michigan, and um, and I guess I had been fortunate because I had heard stories of homesteading, and my understanding of homesteading was I thought it had all kind of happened. I was you know my early when I started my genealogy research years and years and years ago, I had this vision of how they were all like you know homesteaders were like Oregon Trail people or like you know have you seen that movie Far and Away with yeah. Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise <laughs> like that was what I thought homesteading was um, and I mean it's similar but I didn't realize that this was going on into the 1930s and 40s so um, I found out that I had homesteaders my great-grandparents were homesteaders um, in Michigan and um, and so I was able to search for their property records by going to this website that I shared the link for earlier it's the U.S. Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management, um, and it's glorecords.blm.gov. And so all you really need is you need to know the state that they came from, um, and, and it's helpful if you know the county, and then you can search with their name. Um, and sometimes the names will be misspelled, just like with all genealogy, um, a different spelling or a misspelling. Um, and, and you can use other things too if you know the number or if you know the land description, which usually you wouldn't from a genealogist perspective. Um, but you can pull up all the records for those pieces of property and the surrounding pieces of property, which is really nice. So the land patent itself is a grant from the government that says um, there's like a series of, gov of government documents. So it's much like, you know, when somebody files for immigration and you've got like the intent and the declaration and all of those different pieces to it. So what happens is that somebody will decide that they want to... Um, they want to stake a claim and they have to maintain, it's different in different places and at different times, but in general they have to maintain residency there for a certain amount of time and improve the land. Um, and then after that, they put in an application with the government and the government will grant them the right to that property um, with a description and the document is usually signed by the property holder. So it's pretty cool. You get to see their signature, you get to see the legal description of the property. A lot of times there's a patent map. Um, uh, that shows the actual property. They do a nice job over overlaying that on a county map usually, so you can kind of see where it is in relation to other things. And it's also searchable by location, so you can see their neighbors too. So I, I think it's a really cool way to kind of fill in that story of like where your people came from, especially if you see homesteader or if you know the time is a time when people were homesteading, or if you have some free time on your hands. It never hurts to look. If you know that your person was a farmer or had a large piece of property, if you see that in the census record, check it out and see if they homesteaded. You can find out a lot of new information. So I hope that was helpful. Yes, I haven't found any of my relatives in the GLOW records, but uh, many people from Barrington have homesteading records and land grant records uh, going way back. So it's, it's a lot of fun just to want to look at those. And you can get a copy of the original patent, which will be signed by the president at that time. And I've got some from James Madison and um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And you, you, some of it, and it can be that they've gotten land as a military bounty too, that that shows up. Yeah, that's a good point, too. And then that can lead you down a whole new trail if you hadn't found their military records yet. Or that's another way to look. If you know that they fought for a war and there were several, like, I think the Civil War and also the Revolutionary War, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm not a 
military history person at all um, that that did that, um, you know, then that might be an indicator that you should check, um, do a land patent search and just see. Um, and so Tina mentioned that um, Seeking Michigan, now michiganology.org, and she shares the link um, in the chat box is a great website um, resource, which is true. They they have a phenomenal amount. And they, um, they're kind of like the Illinois Digital Archive where they work with a bunch of different institutions and libraries to put information out there, but they also source from individuals. Um, so you'll see like people's personal documents that they've contributed to this website, which is pretty cool. Um, and so outside of that, um, since we talked about the land patent records and some of the military stuff, um, immigration records. So are there places we can go to look for immigration records from home? We can do the Ellis Island Liberty Foundation uh, site, which is open available. I think all you need to do is sign up, much like you do for family search, and you can search all the immigration records from there. Um, and you can also do that in Family Search now. They have both the Ellis Island and the Castle Garden because Castle Garden has gone away unexpectedly. Uh, but those records, I think, were taken up by Ancestry and Family Search. So those are the Castle Garden ones are available there. But Ellis Island has their own as well. I haven't had luck with my personal immigration, so I can't. <laughs> offer any great insight. I agree. Yeah, my, my, my best results have all been through Ancestry and Family Search for Immigration, unfortunately, um, which if you, you know, if you have a strong Ellis Island story, then that's always a great place to check. Although I found, and I don't know if you guys have found this working with patrons specifically, unfortunately, that sometimes those stories, they seem to be really just stories. It's just such a, a popular image, you know, the idea of coming through Ellis Island. And it's not to say that they didn't come at that time or at a nearby port, but a lot of times Ellis Island just doesn't have those records, unfortunately. Right. And there were so many ports that they could have gone through. Uh, and people just automatically think, oh, it must be Ellis Island. Uh, right. But no, it was up and down the coast everywhere. Uh, and Canada, my people came through Canada. So yeah. uh, you Poland. have to look other than Ellis Island. Yeah. And it's also, it's also worth thinking about if you're looking for immigration records, um, the ethnicity of your ancestors that came over and where they wound up. Because like, I think a lot of people, some, like I said, my family's in Michigan. I think a lot of people who came through the North and to the Midwest and probably into Illinois too, I would suspect, came through Canada. Mm -hmm. um, they just kind of, exactly. you know, went over. But another thing that I, I remember learning from, um, Oh my goodness. I learned it at, at Allen County, actually, um, was this, a lot of Germans came in through New Orleans, New Orleans and went up the Mississippi, yes. which was something that I hadn't realized. And it, it was completely fascinating because I would have never thought, oh, let's look for German immigrants to New Orleans. Like that's, that's clearly the port that they would have come in on because you always think of the French, right? Um, so, so it's worth kind of looking at that context, the historical context of like, where were these people going? Where were their clumps of this ethnic group? And then following that trail up. So sometimes you have to think about that kind of as a problem solver. As I said, my Irish relatives came through Canada, ended up in Indiana. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> but I found that to be true. That's awesome. And Anne just said the immigrate, the immigrant ships Transcribers Guild has thousands of lists of transcribed free, transcribed free of access. I'm sorry, guys. Holy cow. Um, free of access with no rec account required. And she shared the link. So that's, that's fabulous. All volunteer transcribed. So it's excellent. What a cool resource. Um, and then another place that you can go um, if you're looking for immigration records is um, Steve Morse's website. And he went through, and I think it's just with Ellis Island, right? He created some, and I haven't used this a lot, um, but he created some pretty cool search algorithms, didn't he? Yes. Yes. He made the, the search engine. It's very plain search engine. There's nothing fancy about it, You, but you can put in your name and uh, place and time, and it'll pull up everything that it can find in various sources. So it's kind of like a one-stop shopping, especially for immigration records. That's awesome. We've got a couple of 
add-ons to other uh, search issues that you can locate at his website. Isn't it stevemorse.org, I think? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. It is. And I'll share that in the chat box. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I can't no. find it. I thought I was the only one that did that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, there are a few good places I think you can go. I think, I think Family Search and Ancestry are always great places to start if you don't have a lot of that background information. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't start um, by pulling up like Ellis Island and just, just, I mean, if you've got a lot of extra time, which I know a lot of us do, why not? But um, it might result in frustration because there's so many, so many options. Someone uh, else had mentioned, I guess it's Judy had mentioned the DAR. Um, if you're trying to connect to those kind of middle generations in America, uh, the DAR.org website can be very useful. Um, you've got, you can see, um, people who have gotten into the DAR. You can see people who were patriots. Um, it's not everybody at all. And it's not always perfect uh, because the DAR's requirements have changed over time and they've gotten much more stringent. But it can be a very useful source. Um, another one, in, well, these aren't free, but you can join all kinds of things. And um, some of these sites, do have um, sometimes limited access to limited records. You know, Ancestry does it every once in a while, usually around military holidays. They'll offer military records for free. Um, I think the censuses tend to be free on Ancestry, whether you have an account, you know, you don't have to have an account. AmericanAncestors.org is the New England Historic and Genealogical Society, and they do offer um, some free records, and they're a wonderful organization to join, but we're not talking about joining things today. Um, and so we had a couple other suggestions from some of our librarian friends. Tina mentioned uh, Brigham Young University has, um, oh good, I lost the chat. Guys, I'm so sorry. They have a really good immigration collection, especially German ships, but others as well. And she gives the address for that. And then Kristen um, mentioned also um, immigration records can help too. Um, and she uses this one with her Norwegian ancestors, norwayheritage.com, and she shares the link. So those are awesome resources as well. And, um, and I think that's a good segue into talking about some different um, specific ethnic research sites that we can use as well for our research. Um, and so Kate, I think you had a couple that you had mentioned, right? Uh, yes, I just uh, because I'm not sure most people know about uh, Afrogenis and Jewish, Jewish Gen. Uh, if you're looking specifically for um, that kind of information, uh, those would be two free sites that you could use. That's great. And of course there are like a gazillion sites for all kinds of different ethnic groups and um, and like that. there are so many that I was looking at this topic and I was like, I think that those are two great ones to use because they they cover such a wide subsection. But to like start talking about, I was like, oh, and the one I use for Dutch research and the one I use for German. But really, if you go to Cindy's list and then the Family Search Wiki, it will pull all of that up for you in such a more concise way than than I could share that with you <laughs> and more completely. So definitely go back to those encyclopedic websites if you're doing any kind of specific ethnic research. And they do have really great things for African-American research and for Jewish genealogy too. And even some, um, I think they have some really great helps for transcribing genealogical terms if you're doing ethnic research. Um, reading different alphabets, like, like mm -hmm. German script can be kind of tricky in some of the old documents, even if you're trying to just retype it into a Google Translate document and not translate it yourself. Um, so they've got helps for handwriting um, in different languages, as well as like things like birth and death and like common terms that we need to be able to recognize in order to quickly assess these records. So check them out for sure. Um, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat, um, but at our library we have a, a list of free overseas uh, record sites for Norway, Australia, Sweden, 
uh, Wales, UK, whatever. Uh, so I'll put that in the chat if anybody would like to visit it. It's just a straight list of, and with links of where you can go to start some overseas research for Germany or wherever. That's awesome, Kate. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then the other thing that we've got um, on our on our list that um, we kind of touched briefly on is where we can look up kind of death records or, or grave records. And so, of course, I think find a grave is the obvious one that we all kind of like, um, it, which is free and has a huge wealth of different information that's user contributed. Um, and you can also search those, of course, I think through both family search and ancestry, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. um, the indexes. And then, uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I love using legacy, uh, I think it's legacy.org to look for obituaries mm -hmm. is kind of a first stop, especially if you're looking for more recent ones, because they've done a really good job of working with um, volunteers and they actually hire um, contract workers to go through and transcribe and um, transcribe obituaries from both funeral homes and newspaper records. Um, and so it's really a, a nice resource. Um, are there any others that you guys would want to mention? We have billion graves on our list. Um, I don't use it that much. I think one of the things I have noticed that I kind of like is it does allow you to um, input um, the GPS coordinates, and I don't, I don't know, does families or, or to find a grave allow that now or not? not I don't sure. remember seeing GPS coordinates. Does anybody know? Um, because I, I spent a, a good half hour walking around a cemetery, a small cemetery, looking for someone. It looks like Kim and Ellen say that the, the uh, well, Ellen says on the app they do, and Kim says that yes, find a grave now does. Okay. Yeah, that would, to me, that was a limitation to find a grave, but this was a few years ago, too. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and Kimberly says also that she's taken about 500 photos in four different cemeteries over the past weeks, and they're still open um, doing transcriptions for find a grave. So that actually sounds like a wonderful way to get out of the house and take a walk <laughs> without meeting many people. That's an awesome idea. <laughs> um, and then... Was it you, Kate, who mentioned internment.net, or was that you, Nancy? No, it wasn't me. Uh, yes, that as a tertiary <laughs> uh, site, as I, I don't find it as useful, of course, as Find a Grave, but um, it's a place, it's another place to look if you haven't found it in the other two. And of course, with, especially with Find a Grave and Billion Graves, both of them, you can sign up for an account and you can add your people to it. You can add, you know, like, was it Kim was saying, you can go and um, during this quarantine time, you can take some pictures and do some uploading of information. If you come across family members that, you know, you would like to have uh, control over, you know, maybe there's some incorrect information or you'd like, you know, just to get them together, you can contact the person who has, um, I can't remember what it's called, but they, they sponsor that uh, Find a Grave Memorial. You can take over the memorial. Um, people who have put up a memorial are supposed to turn it over to family members. Sometimes they don't pay attention to you. Um, recently I've had some experience with that and I've contacted Find a Grave and shown them that I've given the people a couple weeks, I've given them a couple requests, and Find a Grave turned it right over to me right away. Um, you know, one of them was my father that, it, you know, it was incorrect. And I was able to gain sponsorship of it and correct it. And, you know, that's that. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, and so somebody here recommended, um, oh, goodness. Anne recommended, once you find a burial, you should try to find a web page for the cemetery. Some will have searchable databases, and you may be able to find extended family by looking at the same plot, lot, section, et cetera. That's a great tip. Um, that's really an excellent bit of advice. And Dan mentioned that he's finding a lot more recent death notices through Googling than through Legacy, um, which is also a really good tip. It never hurts, especially if you're looking for something recent, to put it into Google with some quotations around it um, and see what pops up because you might find something really useful. Or you might find a new website that has other information on your family members that 
we didn't mention or we don't know about. <laughs> um, so now uh, we've got, I think we're going to go just a couple more minutes. Um, if you, anybody has any questions, you're welcome to mention them. In the meantime, um, again, I think like like I said, just to refresh everybody, we're gonna we're gonna go through the chat, and I'm gonna pull together all of these websites, and I'll email them out to everybody who is registered for this. We also are recording this web uh, webcast. Let's call it a, just a, it's a Zoom chat. Chat <laughs> recording the Zoom chat. Um, so I'm not sure where we're gonna where we're gonna put it right now, um, but. We will in the next couple of weeks have the first Zoom chat and this one available um, as well as the rest of them so that people can watch them if you want to get the information again, if you would like to share it with somebody um, or for anybody who wasn't able to be here tonight. Um, but you guys have been fabulous. There have been so many wonderful suggestions, things that I've never used coming up. Um, and we just uh, got something from Sue saying very fleeg flag has a website, um, Chicago and Cook County Cemeteries.com that has information from the old Dunning Cemetery burials. That's really cool too. Um, so really awesome resources, guys. I feel like I learned a ton from you, from both you, Kate, and you, Nancy, and from everybody who was participating tonight. This was wonderful. Crowdsourcing. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so before I let you all go, just so everybody is aware, we, um, it looks like we will be hosting these Zoom chats um, on Wednesday nights at six o'clock through May as well. So keep looking for those. We'll continue to post them on the Eventbrite website. So that will be the best place to find the newest information if you haven't heard from us directly from whoever your librarian is or from wherever you got this information to start with. Um, and so coming up next week, um, let me pull up the page real quick here. Um, we have, um, organization. And so we're going to have a few librarians um, coming to talk about how to organize your genealogy project if you're feeling the itch to, to um, do some spring cleaning with your files or your papers. Um, and we plan to talk on both forms of organization, both electronic digital organization as well as physical. Um, and then we're going to be doing, we have, I know it was to be announced at first, but we have come up with a topic for our third <laughs> session. Um, so that is going to be busting brick walls. Um, and so the next one will be next Wednesday, April 22nd. The uh, final one in April will be April 29th. Um, and then look, coming forward in May, if you guys have suggestions on some topic that you would like to see, we would be happy to try. If we have any expertise, we'd be happy to try to work that into an upcoming session um, and talk to you about whatever it is you're interested in. So feel free to email um, your librarian or you can email me. I'm kind of organizing everything and coordinating it. So I'm happy to, to, to take emails from any of you. My um, email, I will type it into the chat box is Tara, T-A-R-A dot Kajacob, C-A-J-A-C-O-B at A-A-P-L-D dot org. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. I'd also love any input that you have um, about any of this, how the format works for you, what you think. Um, and uh, some topics that we've been playing with are DNA. Um, we are looking at maybe talking about some Cook County or Chicago specific resources. Um, so just let us know what you'd like to hear. And with that, um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I think we'll let you guys go. Have a wonderful week, and hopefully you guys can make it next week. We're looking forward to seeing you. Stay healthy. Yes. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.